حقا لا اله الا الله ان الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح للامه وجاهد في الله حق جهاده ارض اللهم عن الصحابه والتابعين وتابعيهم باحسان الى يوم الدين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه العزيز يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم اذ كنتم اعداء فالف بين قلوبكم فاصبحتم بنعمته اخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فانقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم اياته لعلكم تهتدون صدق الله العظيم Dear brothers and sisters in the beginning of February khutbah I like to follow a specific outline in which I remind my brothers and sisters of the context in which we live. Because a khutbah that doesn't relate to the context is mental exercise. It's theoretical, it's educational, but it's not, it's not as beneficial as one that relates to the circumstances that we live. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an example. Whenever something happened that needed attention, he used to call the mu'adhan to make the adhan. And he used to gather the people in the masjid, and he used to speak on the topic that needs attention. Sometimes he would start, ma balu aqwam in kada wa kada. Why do some people do this and that? In other times, it was something more important, as I explained in the last khutbah, in Hajjat al when he sallallahu alayhi wa spoke about the most important issues in the life of a Muslim, not at that time, but throughout history, until Yawm al-Qiyamah. Issues of social justice, fairness, equality, and blood, sacredness, and so on and so forth. At that time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saved that major topic to Hajjat al-Wada' which was attended at best estimate by more than 140,000 people. We need to learn from that. But not only that, also those who have had the fortune of being in graduate school in this country, especially those who wrote dissertations, know that every thesis or dissertation at the graduate level has to start by identifying the context. You speak about what it is that requires attention. Then you speak about the problem that needs attention. Then you speak about what others said about the topic. And then you present a solution. That's the outline. And I've been following that outline for several years. I started giving khutbahs more than 35 years ago. But seven, eight years ago, I upgraded my discourse and I started speaking according to this outline because I believe it's more beneficial. So what is the context? The context that we live in is very existential, meaning, so I explained in Arabic what the word context means. Um, we need to understand what is going on. Some think of the circumstances that we are going through as a passing phase, and that somehow the people that intended harm to Muslims have lost, so it's over, we can go celebrate now. We're done. In reality, brothers and sisters, I, I want to share with you just a little bit of history. Years ago, there was a professor in Colombia by the name Edward Said. May Allah have mercy on his soul. He was not a Muslim, but he defended Islam better than many Muslims. He actually wrote books about in defense of Islam. 
as a non-Muslim. He wrote his, his most famous book was called Orientalism. And in it, he explained that the West has never stopped talking about Muslims in a certain way that depicts us as bloodthirsty, sex-crazed maniacs who are out there to avenge from the other people that we are not civilized, that we on and on and on. And you may think, well, that's just in theory, that that's, that's how they think of us, and that's fine. In reality, that's not fine, because that was the basis. That was the basis for the Sykes-Picot agreement, which was used to slice our countries in the Middle East into small, little, tiny countries that we see today. Sykes-Picot was nothing more than a manifestation of Orientalism. When Sykes and Picot, the foreign ministers of Britain and England, to reward the Arabs who fought with them in the First World War for fighting the Muslim Ottoman Empire alongside the British and the French. They promised them independence. They promised them a democratic state. And the Arabs believed that King Faisal, Amir Faisal, the son of Sharif Hussein, in Damascus, together with the Syrians and the Lebanese, the, the Bilad al-Sham, the scholars of Bilad al-Sham, designed a constitution that rivals the constitution of the United States, in which civil liberties, human rights, everything was guaranteed to everyone. This is in 1919. But no, the decision was made that these people are nomads. They are incapable of ruling themselves. An American emissary that was in the Middle East at that time who reported back to the Wilson administration about the status of Muslims and whether they were killed, because America was in favor of the Arabs having independence. And they liked the Constitution. This young man is from the Yale dynasty, the same Yale dynasty that founded Yale University. He's one of their kids. He wrote back basically saying that we don't deserve democracy. A professor by the name Elizabeth, I forgot her last name, I think Armstrong, recently published a book in which she said how the West stole democracy from the Arabs. That's the exact title of the book, how they stole democracy. They destroyed the Constitution. They burned every single copy. And they drove Amir Faisal and uh, our Syrian brothers know the Battle of Maisalun. They know Yusuf al adma They know the history of that area. Syria was destroyed. Palestine was put under General Alimbi and then under the mandate for 30 years. And we know what happened in 1947 after that. Why am I giving you this history? To prove to you the point that perception becomes reality. That if they perceive us as people who are not worthy of human rights or civil rights, they will enact policies, and they have done enacted policies that reflect that understanding. And unless we fight that understanding at the core, we will become what they want us to become. That's what happens. Sykes-Picot became a reality. So in the beginning, it was called uh, Orientalism. Later on, that was morphed into what's now called Islamophobia. The difference is that Orientalism was an intellectual exercise. You're, you read about it, you write about it. It was in Hollywood. Jack Shaheen wrote a book called Real Bad Arabs. Not real, real bad Arabs. And he sh showed tons of examples of how the Muslims and Arabs are depicted in the media and in Hollywood, which also helped pave the way for the current Islamophobia craze. The difference is that Islamophobia now is backed by budgets of literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And it has one purpose, and that's to make us less citizens than we deserve to be. And you'll see the proof in a moment, inshallah, I'll get to that. But before I get into all of that, let me remind you of two or three ayat from the Quran that sets the stage for what needs to happen in response to this context that we live in. Allah Azza wa in Surah An-Nisa, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين توفاهم الملائكة ظالمي أنفسهم قالوا فيما كنتم 
قالوا كنا مستضعفين في الأرض قالوا ألم تكن أرض الله واسعة فتهاجروا فيها فأولئك ما أواهم جهنم وساءت مصيرا والعياذ بالله الله عز وجل سيزن سورة النساء إن الذين توفاه الملائكة ظالمي أنفسهم There are some people that when the angels come to extract their soul they say to them what, what, what was going on? Why are you dying Zalim and ill-treating yourself, in other words, shortchanging yourself. Not a perfect Muslim, a fraction of a Muslim, if at all. Why? They're asking, you and me. Fima Kuntum, what was going on? There in New Jersey, what was going on? What do we answer? We say, Kunna Mustadafina Flord. Ya Allah, we didn't have congressmen, we didn't have senators, we didn't have money, we didn't have media, we didn't have CNN, we didn't have any of that stuff. That would be our answer. We had no power. What are the answer? Weren't there other places that you can go where you can practice? If, you, if what we claim is true, that we have no chance of defending ourselves, then get out. Don't stay here. We've seen nine million of our Syrian brothers leave their home country, but they had no choice. Those people were burned day and night. They were destroyed. Their kids were killed. More than a million of them dead. But what about us? They would say to us one or two things. Either you're lying, and you should have done something. Or, if you are truly unable to do anything, get out. Go to Canada, go to Mexico, go somewhere else. That would be the answer of the angels. That's the translation of the ayah. Look it up. Ayah 97 in Surah An-Nisa. Qalu kunna mustadafina bilad. Qalu alam takun ardu Allahi wasi'atan fatuhajir fiya. Why don't you make hijra? And then Allah Azza wa Jal decrees. And says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ These Allah Azza wa Jal will put in Jahannam. The ones that have the ability to do something and refuse or, or, or do not out of laziness or rejection or for whatever reason, don't do it. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ I pray to Allah that we're not among those. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to spare us having to answer كُنَّا مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Because we're not. Surah Al-Anfal. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Beware of a fitna, fitna, tumult. Difficult times, tragedies that will not strike only the perpetrators, but rather even the victims will bear responsibility for what is happening to them. The ayah says, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ The fitna will, the punishment for the fitna will not only be to perpetrators, but those who allowed it to happen. Malik ibn Nabi, one of the great scholars of North Africa, more than probably 70 years ago, wrote books in which he explained that people become colonized when they are ready to be colonized. They allow it to happen. Here we have a slogan in New Hampshire that says, give me death or give me liberty. That's an Islamic concept. That's what the Quran here says. Another ayah. Allah Azza wa Jalla in two surahs, has the same ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, and I believe in Surah, uh, in Surah Al-Hajj. A sunnah, an axiom that you see in the Quran, and there are many of them. Al-Kareem Zaydan put them in a book called Sunanullahi fil Afradi wal Umami wal Jama'at. The, the rules or the laws of Allah, it, as it pertains to individuals, societies, and groups. That's the name of the book. And he identified all those ayahs in the Quran that deserve to be axioms. Yani qawaid asasiyya. Axioms means rules. Sunan rabbaniyya. One of them. Sunnah tadafa. The law of pushing and shoving. In, in, in simple lingo, that's what it means. Daf'a. Daf'a. Daf'a is to push. As opposed to pull. If it wasn't for Allah making people 
push and shove each other. At one point, there was the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, and there was some sort of balance in the world. Before that, 1,400 years ago, it was the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. When you see that, that's the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, creates two so-called superpowers so that one would check the other one and there would not be tumult. So Allah Azza wa Jal explains that in the Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ If it wasn't for Allah Azza wa Jal pushing people against one another, checking people by, by uh, one another, لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ the entire earth that we live on will be corrupted. This is, this is a blessing from Allah, that there is no one superpower that gets to control the world. Otherwise, what would they do? In Surah Al-Hajj, it tells us what they would do. It says, Salawat are churches, monasteries, and synagogues. Three of them mentioned before wa masajid. To show that when tumult takes place, when there is no checking of power, everybody becomes a victim, not just Muslims. And if you read history, many of us, unfortunately, we, we, we have not, we didn't go to high school in this country. Many, not, not all. I see a lot of young people here who may have. Those who have not studied American history probably don't know about church burning in the South. I mean, until recently, maybe 10 years ago, we were reading about another black church being burned every other day. That's, that's what the Quran is talking about. If you don't stop those people who are burning the churches, they will come to your mosque. So, the topic that I'm talking about today to solve this problem is addressed in social science, and I'll start it today because I don't have much time. But I'll, I'll continue it in future khutbas, inshallah. This topic is covered under, uh, under the title Social Movement. And social Movement is not a book. It's not a course to be taught in graduate school. It, it's, it's, it's a strand of social science that is taught there are literally thousands and thousands of divisions under that title. But in, in, in simple terms, the scholars say that people tend to act under what is called a social movement, like the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, so on and so forth. Right now, Black Lives Matter movement. Now the Asian Lives Matter movement, because many of our South Asian brothers are being attacked. Uh, uh, they're being called Chinese and they're being attacked. This is happening right now as we speak. The theory is that one or two things have to happen for, for the social movement to actually take place. The first one is resources. In other words, that people have the ability, they have the intellectual capacity to understand what's going on. They have the physical power, the money, the manpower, the ability to actually make a difference. So that when one leader says, let's all demonstrate in Times Square that tens of thousands of people show up. That's basically what it is. So that's one part. But there's another one, that when the pain becomes intolerable, when the damage becomes so bad that people must do something. And the Quran has defined that moment in Surah, uh, I believe in Surah Nisa also, Another ayah, لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم. Allah Azza wa Jal says that things reach a point where normal speech, which is usually not allowed, vulgar speech, speech of profanity, of screaming and shouting, which is normally not allowed, would be allowed when somebody is under oppression. لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول. Speaking vulgar language, where you're attacking others, you're screaming, shouting, cursing, demonstrating, maybe even breaking glass and windows, doing a lot of the stuff that we see happening there within the context of Black Lives Matter or any other demonstration. Believe it or not, the Quran says, except when there is dhulm. When there is dhulm, all bets are off. No civility. I'm not making this up. Read the ayah. This is ayah in surah, go back and check it. Surah Nisa, surah 4, ayah 148. 
148 check it out لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم so social movement action يا إخوة is required when people's existence is threatened and I present you here maybe not in this khutbah in the next one I will present you with examples that show the following number one to understand citizenship, which many of us think that it protects us, that citizenship is actually four different parts. If we create an analytical framework so that we can understand what citizenship is, it has four parts. The one part that we all know is the certificate that you get when you take the, swear the oath to become a good citizen. That's only the legal part of it. But citizenship implies a bundle of rights, there are a bundle of rights that when you are deprived of, you are less of a citizen than you claim to be. Let's make dua and inshallah I'll finish it with the second khutbah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So citizenship yaqwa, involves four things. Number one, the legal formal part, which most of us have. And by the way, even that they attempted to revoke. Have you ever heard of the HLF 5, the Holy Land Foundation 5, that were sentenced to 65 years in prison for, for, for aiding our brothers and sisters in Palestine? They tried to revoke their citizenship. They couldn't. They couldn't. But don't you think that they will not try again? There's something that we teach. I teach uh, courses at Rutgers. And one of the courses we teach is, is a master's level public administration course. Talks about how decisions are made in government. One of the methods, there's the basic method of cost benefit analysis. If something costs too much, we don't do it. If it's manageable, is the return on investments good? All of that basic stuff that many of you already know. But there is one that I was shocked when I read about. And it's called the inverted garbage can model. A long name, developed by a professor by the name Cohen. You know what it means? It means what doesn't work today will try again tomorrow under different circumstances, and it will pass. And do you know what they, what, what they use as an example, what we use to teach that example of decision making at the government level? We use the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is 1,400 pages of legislation that was passed literally a month after September 11. And people say, how? How is that even possible to put legislation, 1,400 pages of detailed manifestation of what to do to these Muslims. In a record month, we couldn't pass the Brady Bill, anti-gun legislation Brady Bill, since the shooting of President Reagan. To this day, it hasn't, been, it hasn't passed. How could the Patriot Act, which violated civil liberties of Americans like you and me, in less than a month? The answer is very simple. The Patriot Act was nothing more than scraps Think of scraps of paper, something that you write, then you throw it in the garbage until the garbage can is full. And then one day there's an opportunity. Same, somebody says, what were you saying before? Over the last week, month, year, or whatever. You say, oh, it, it's in the garbage can. So they say, turn it over. So you turn it over. And you put all that stuff in the garbage that you before thought is worthless, but it's saved in the garbage can. You open it up, you put them together, and it becomes the new, the new law. That is exactly how the Patriot Act was passed. The Patriot Act was not a new initial work that started after September 11. It was attempted, every bit of it was attempted years and years earlier to curtail our rights from, from the days of the Oklahoma City bombing or even before that. And it didn't pass. But they didn't give up. They kept saving all those scraps of paper until the time of September 11, that was an opportunity. You can pass anything on that day, against, especially against Muslims. And it was passed by overwhelming majority. So brothers, let me make it very clear to you that unless, unless we perceive the threat 
against our existence in this country with the seriousness as it des that it deserves. And unless we put our hands together, just like you did in establishing this masjid, you see, they first come and they say, well, the, 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 we didn't receive proper notice. I didn't get no, my notice. Isn't this what they did? They did this in Tennessee in another masjid. So then the, the government says, okay, let's give everybody notice. So they'll give them an extension and they do notice. Then they come back and they say, well, it's not just that. There's like traffic. There's going to be a lot of traffic out there because these muzzies have cars. So, so then we prove to them that, no, there's not going to be a problem. It's only one day a week, Friday, and maybe in Ramadan. They'll come back. In Tennessee, they even attempted and claimed and took it all the way to the Supreme Court. They attempted to say that Islam is not a religion, that we are nothing more than a cult. The Department of Justice itself had to come in and say, we recognize Islam as a world great religion. But that was then. Next time, there will not be a Department of Justice that will rush to our help and say, no, no, Muslims are OK. They are, they are a religion. There could be a Department of Justice that will come and say, yeah, we are a cult. And then all these masajid will be challenged. Or at least no new masjid will be established. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, there is more on this topic, inshallah, the, other, the, the four parts of citizenship. There's one part that I spoke about two khutbas ago, which is political activism. And then there's the identity part. I will cover them, inshallah, in a future khutbah. But I want to leave you with this thought. Start thinking about the future of your children and grandchildren. If you and I feel safe and we feel like we've done our job, we came to this country poor, and now, mashallah, we have houses, we have cars, we have money in the bank, we have bitcoins, and God knows how, well, how else we're building wealth. But let me tell you something. Things could be different for our children. And if not for our children, for our grandchildren. If you love your grandchildren, start acting now. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العليم لي ولكم فيها فوزا مستغفر الله منصر الإسلام وعلى وعظ الله منصر الإسلام والمسلمين وعلي بفضلك كلمة الحق ودين ووفقنا لما تحب وترضاه أمين اللهم من أراد بالإسلام والمسلمين خيرا فوفقه إلى كل خير ومن أراد بالإسلام والمسلمين سوءا فخذه أخذ عزيز مقتدر يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وإن عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم واستغفروه يغفر لكم وأكم الصلاه